2006, he was appointed the McKnight Distinguished Visiting Professor uh, Award in the Department of Chemical Engineering at University of Minnesota in Duluth. Also taught chemical theory of biomimetic materials um, and also authored 26 patents and numerous journal publications in tissue engineering and regenerative medicine, which is very helpful for our purposes today. Appreciate him being on today. And also we have Mr. David Langley, who has uh, been a colleague of Dr. Brecky's for several years and uh, has been involved in marketing research, project management, um, specifically for the EpiGuides early history, and also previously worked in various functions at the uh, US Marine Corps down in Bradstreet, among others, and received his degree in business administration from the University of Minnesota. And my name is Shane Ray. I'm president of Curacin. I'm in the United States here, and we're located in North Carolina. Um, and Dr. Brecky and Mr. Langley are today located in, uh, in Duluth, Minnesota. So I've been with Curacin for around uh, three and a half years and excited to, uh, to help facilitate this uh, webinar and discussion today. So the agenda that we're going to have really, as, as I mentioned, is an informal discussion um, and a conversation with, uh, with our presenters here. We'll talk about the EpiGuide composition and its importance, specifically also the history of the development, what was the purpose of the design criteria that we used, and what was the reasonings um, for why we've developed the EpiGuide membrane, and uh, also a background and some unique properties of the membrane itself. Um, we'll also go over briefly some clinical importance and some evidence that we can describe, some frequently asked questions, and then also we'll have some Q&A sessions at the end as well. Um, since we are in uh, listen-only mode, feel free to type any questions in the chat box, um, and that way you'll be able to, uh, we'll, at the end of the presentation, we'll be able to, to go through these, pre these questions, and Dr. Brecky, uh, Mr. Langley, and myself will be happy to help address some of those. So again, we uh, will go ahead and get started here, and we appreciate your attendance. As far as the EpiGuide and its composition, um, it's a fully resorbable synthetic dental membrane. It's composed primarily of D, D, L, and L polylactic acid. And, and we'll go into some details of why that was selected and why, what makes that important for the, uh, for the composition. Um, one thing that hopefully you'll understand before the end of the day today is the three layers and its importance of having those three layers, really with this open construction. Um, the sterile membranes are provided in 18 by 30 millimeter um, sizes in single use, and they can also be easily cut and shaped into the, uh, into the surgical site and the defect site that you need to treat. Um, the whole design premise really was to guide the invasion of fibroblasts in a novel and a high-tech way for GTR, and, and we'll go into that in, in the subsequent slides as we, uh, as we talk about this, uh, this high-tech way of infiltrating fibroblasts and using um, EpiGuide as a facilitator of soft tissue remodeling. Um, maintaining the architecture and structural integrity has always been um, an important aspect of this membrane, but it's been, uh, it has an evidence for 20 weeks with complete resorption into the host tissue within 12 months. That's what we've seen clinically and that's what the, um, the product has been designed to do. But the architecture and the structural integrity is unique and uh, we'll go over some additional details regarding that. It does provide um, dependable healing and tissue regeneration, despite flat progression or failure to achieve primary closure. Certainly primary closure um, is, is needed and preferred, um, but we've seen some evidence that its architecture can be helpful if you're not able to maintain that primary closure. And uh, Dr. Brecky will go into some details about that as well. As far as the importance to Curacin EpiGuide, this is our number one membrane that we have. Um, globally. Um, this is also it has an excellent history of clinical benefit and value to our customers and to the patients that we serve. So, uh, so we appreciate this, uh, this time that you're involved with us in learning more about EpiGuide and specifically some of the details. So a brief history of EpiGuide. Um, really, development started in 1989 and its FDA registration was in and its clearance was in 1997. The uh, membrane itself was purchased by Kinsey Nash, which is now known as DSM. Um, and we've worked with, with Kinsey Nash and DSM as the exclusive distributor of EpiGuide since 2005. So this has been a hallmark of our, 
of our membrane um, portfolio for several years here and 14 years at Curasan. Some of the reasons for development, what I'd like to ask is for uh, Mr. Um, David Langley to discuss a little bit of details about uh, the process that they've gone through on the history and, and the reasons for the development. So I'd like to turn it over to, to you, David. Thank you. Epigod was uh, conceptualized in 1989 as a result of uh, contacts with dental professionals for about a six month period where uh, the pattern was repeatedly identified. What they wanted and really wanted was uh, a way to deal with soft tissue in following dental surgery in terms of uh, better healing, better site uh, protection, and better, uh, better results. And uh, I was in contact with Dr. Brecky many times, and I uh, developed a, a set of uh, requirements uh, and then kept communicating with him, and he said, yes, we can do this. And so we went ahead with the uh, development uh, design. And we were very fortunate that uh, Oh, if, as I recall, almost the first uh, uh, crack at it, he was able to come up with the uh, right design, and we tested it early at Oklahoma, and it worked, and uh, went ahead with a clinical uh, investigation after uh, that time. Okay, great. Maybe talk to us a little bit about the, uh, and whether it's Dr. Brecky or, or David, about the uh, the need to have this living tissue barrier. I think that's a, that's a unique concept and a unique word and phrase here. This uh, the living tissue barrier. Maybe you guys can go into a little detail about that. Uh, yes, I'll cover that. The concept was to have fluid blood invade the uh, membrane, and immediately at that point, the matrix and the uh, blood. Uh, became a functional living tissue barrier, and that never ceased, uh, it never transitioned. All it was is as uh, the other tissues uh, invaded and like the fibroblasts and so on. When, they, uh, when that became more and more present, then eventually the uh, matrix would bioresorb away, but the cells there and present continued to operate as a living tissue barrier from beginning to end. And in some cases, uh, we've seen that there's evidence of the uh, living tissue barrier, very thin sheet being present, uh, but uh, uh, not uh, in a bad way uh, many months later on. Okay. So, uh, and we're going to go into a little more detail about, uh, you know, some SEM images and histology of, of how we can show evidence of that design. So uh, thank you for that, that history there. Sure. Um, what I'd like to do now is go over a little bit um, from the design and the clinical need and, and sort of, you know, when you're presented with this um, indications, you know, what can you do? And that's sort of some of the reasons why EpiGuide was, uh, was created. So maybe Dr. Brecky, you can, uh, um, provide some detail on on these these two images and the importance of how EpiGuide can be beneficial. Yes, uh, the uh, EpiGuide, as David just pointed out, is designed to uh, actually become integrated into the mucoperiosteal flap that is always present over a um, uh, a void in the alveolus. So what we have here is a class two percation defect on the left hand side of the screen. Um, you know, threatening existence of a very expensive and very important bridge abutment. Uh, Twelve months later, um, the in the re reentry uh, shows a, an excellent bone regeneration phenomenon. That wouldn't happen if the fibroblasts from the mucoperiosteal flap had been allowed to invade that bone void and obstruct the deposition of new bone from the cancellous bone between the buccal and the lingual cortical plates. And that's what guy does. Okay. Um, it sounds like we may be having uh, some difficulty hearing you guys. So um, oh, okay. for those that are on, for those that are on, maybe you can just type a little message here on the chat box. If you can hear Dr. Brecky, I just want to make sure before we get too crazy here, 
to make sure you guys can hear everyone. I know, I believe you can hear me, but I want to make sure you can hear those guys. Yes, well, I mean, can you hear me better now, Shane? Because I'm, 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 I don't know if they can hear you at all. That's what we wanted oh, to do. Oh, I see. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> so yes. um, let's make sure. So if you're, uh, if, if, if you're on, if you can just um, pop a message over there in the chat, just to make sure you can hear Dr. Brecky, um, who just spoke just a second ago. Because I'm uh, not sure. Let me, I'm gonna make sure, see if there's something I can do with you. Um, Look at that. It says your mic is on um, and your camera is on. So, not sure. Uh, anyone else want to be able to present, provide the details there? Um, hmm. Not sure. Um, well, what we'll do is we'll just keep going, and then uh, if we need to, uh, if we need to um, change anything, we can. But I believe you're set up, guys, directly so that you can uh, you can be heard, and uh, and your mic is on and everything. So um, we'll just keep going here. Okay. So uh, you've talked about the re-entry, you've talked about that. Anything else you wanna go over regarding the, uh, these two images here and the, and the, the, um, the actual importance of this um, type of technology? Well, the, the Epic Guide, it, it shows dramatically, I think, and, and favorably, the um, net result of the barrier function of Epic Guide. It prevents competing cells from entering the bone void and obstructing uh, the regeneration of new bone from the bone marrow of the cancellous bone located between the buccal and the lingual cortical plates. Okay, that sounds, I mean, it's what we've seen and I think it's one of the, the more interesting aspects of a challenging case there. Um, next on this slide is the, the importance of the three layers, um, having the, uh, um, you know, this clogged filter or this filter effect, if, if you would like, um, and how it was designed. So um, perhaps you guys can go over some details regarding these three different sections and, uh, and the importance of guiding these fibroblasts. Yes, well, I'll, I'll take that, uh, John Brecky here. On the left is a uh, cross-section scanning electron micrograph, probably at um, about 500x of the epiguide membrane. Um, as, uh, as we get them now, they're um, 250 micrometers in thickness. They could be thicker. The interstices or void structure of the epiguide sheet at the very top is very large and accommodates the larger cells of fibroblasts. As you move through the sheet, toward the surface that will be in contact with the, the alveolus and the bone void, the interstices or the holes, the voids, get sm progressively smaller and eventually block, physically block, further migration of the fibroblast. Nevertheless, they will conduct um, fluids, the interstitial fluids. Um, you could think of the interstitial fluids as a nutrient media for the cells that are there. Right. So basically, as you're, as these um, fibroblasts are moving through, they're they're going through this sort of uh, this highway where eventually there's traffic. Right. So um, you're going to have the fibroblasts collect and and start to uh, basically um, stop in traffic as it <laughs> as it goes through this. Uh, this membrane, but it still it lets the uh, the fluids through, which helps in the bone defect yeah. site, but also helps as they remodel into the yeah. patient's own soft tissue. Well, Shane, it's more than just a traffic problem. They just <laughs> can't get they just can't get there from here. <laughs> right. I'd like to I'd like to add at that point is that when they stop at that uh, like the traffic uh, congestion, mm -hmm. it's also designed to favorably. Uh, generate collagen at that point. The cells are altered in shape to uh, encourage uh, generation of collagen. Well, yeah, yeah, they do. The, the fibroblasts will do what fibroblasts do. That's uh, synthesize and secrete type one collagen. Right. And, and, and as this is going on, the fibroblasts originate from the um, periosteal surface of the mucoperiosteal flap. Well, uh, okay, that makes the membrane 
and now these cells, integral parts of the normal tissue. Right. That's great. And I think this is one of the most important aspects of our of our uh, membrane, just this this architecture and this novel aspect of it. So thank you for uh, for providing that information. Um, as far as the uh, the PLA and, and use of the PLA, not not all um, polymers, specifically polylactic acid, are created equal. Um, and uh, Dr. Brecky and and uh, the colleagues there selected D, D, L, and L primarily for its safety and biocompatibility um, profile that that assists. Um, so you want to make sure that when you're um, when you're providing polymers specifically, you need to be able to create this three different layers, and that that requires a certain type of polymer anyway. But also you need to be able to uh, to have the polymer where it's um, immunolo immunologically privileged, so that it would be considered inactive or not bioreactive to the body. And uh, I think PLA is is well known throughout a lot of literature and clinical use of being an acceptable. Um, immune privileged um, polymer. It's also non-toxic and it's fully resorbed within 12 months. And I think because of that um, D, D, L, and L, um, and how the uh, how that, that chemistry is, is, uh, was created, it allows for this remodeling, but it also allows for um, a, a muted immune response, um, you know, within what a normal healing response would be. When, as far as the epigod in the wound, um, really suture dehiscence and small gingival recession is less of a problem because of the safety and biocompatibility pro, um, profile. And would you guys like to add any, any extra comments regarding the, uh, the PLA and its selection and its uh, safety and biocompatibility? Well, I'd love to. <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> and, uh, there are many different species of polylactic acid. And the DDLL species of polylactic acid is a racemic mixture of two optically active enantiomers, one, one bending polarized light to, in one direction to the right and the other to the left. Uh, it gets pretty deep in the weeds after that. But the net, uh, net effect of that is that DDLL polylactic acid does not crystallize. And if there are no microscopic crystallites formed, as a consequence of the polymerase chemistry, then the foreign body giant cell reaction is much reduced as it biodegrades away. Okay. Yeah. And this is in an, a journal article um, with uh, Dr. Vernino and Dr. Brecky um, describing its its uh, you know its profile and its use in uh, periodontal um, defects. So um, I think that's a great a great uh, article that we can certainly give you guys access to. All right, well, thank you for that. And um, the next slide we have here is, uh, is is sort of a cartoon as it describes what the cells come in contact with those three different layers. And uh, as Dr. Brecky uh, states, it gives cells an offer they can't refuse. So perhaps you guys can just go into a little bit of detail of, of, of uh, what we're seeing here in this cartoon. Well, we, we borrowed a cartoon off off the internet and, <laughs> and, and juxtaposed it to the surface of the epigite that you've seen in a prior slide, in a previous slide. Epithelial cell, uh, pardon me, um, fibroblasts are going to migrate. That's what they do. You can't stop it. Mm -hmm. What we uh, tried to do, or what we uh, one of the goals of the epigite design, is to give the Empathy, the fibroblasts, a location into which they can migrate that will prevent them from migrating into the bone void that is under regeneration. And that's, that's what we tried to depict with this slide. Mucoperial seal flap over top and um, fibroblasts um, down below secreting type 1 collagen. And uh, in another slide, probably the next one, uh, we can show you what the net result of that is. All right, it was a good segue into this slide here, which is the, uh, you know, the histological evidence. I, I like seeing histology slides specifically, um, especially if they're in, a, uh, in a, um, an animal model or even within, within a human model for on the dental defects, because it kind of shows you what's going on on a cellular level within the defect site. So uh, um, 
Dr. Brecky has uh, talked to, to us about um, this being a rat calvarial um, defect model, which is a critical size defect model um, yeah. that's, that's known not to form bone um, within that defect size. So it's a, it's a critical size, meaning it will not um, form on its own. Um, so um, maybe you can describe a little bit about what you're seeing. This image on the left looks very similar to what the SEM images just showed us of the three different layers and this runway of how, this, how the cells are, are crowding in to the, um, to the epigod membrane. Well, yes, we're, we're much relieved that it does. <laughs> if it did, we have a problem. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, fi the fibroblasts, uh, uh, Shane, if you just go back to the previous slide one sure. more time. Yeah. Okay. You, you have the, the large void structure up on the top of Epiguide. You've got um, uh, a burgeoning population of fibroblasts coming down with the mucoperiosteal flap. And uh, what did it say here? 12 weeks later? No. Um, hmm, how far out is this? This slide here is 14 days. 14 days. Okay, sure. Um, what you're seeing on this histology is a cross section of the membrane having been placed over a critical size defect, a defect in the rad calvarium, a defect that will not uh, regenerate bone sim uh, spontaneously. Mm -hmm. And the fibroblasts are now entrapped. Can you point, uh, Shane? I don't think I can. Um, sure. Fibroblasts are are um, invested within the interstices of the membrane. Uh, as you go further down toward the defect, um, it becomes a very dense collection of cells that are that have also accumulated on the inner surface from the defect itself. These are in the process of maturing into. Um, uh, either scar tissue or bone, but they are not inhibiting the defect. Also, there's evidence of uh, vascular elements as well, as you can see. Yeah. Um, so this truly is a living, uh, a living membrane. Well, yes, it's drawn its collateral circulation from the from the overlying mucoperiosteum. Right. It, it is integrated now with that normal tissue. Right. It's great. Okay, well, thanks. There's also an article um, that's listed here on the right um, describing the histological evidence of, of that. So uh, that's also available. Um, let's switch um, gears into the epiguide placement. Um, on the left, we really have, we have the, the epiguide membrane um, being placed into the defect site. And it's important that you, um, you allow the hydration to be of the site fluids and not hydrate it um, prior to placement with either saline or water. Think of it as a, as a filter. If you pre-wet a filter, it's really hard to have, um, to have fluids or, or any kind of cellular material kind of go through that filter. Um, so what you want is you want it to be hydrated locally in the site um, with the site blood and with the site um, autologous fluids that are there. On the right-hand side is the uh, fully saturated um, piece of epiguide that is um, saturated with patient's blood at the site, which is a you know the correct way of, of placing it. So uh, you guys want to provide any additional details um, in Duluth there of, of these two images? Yeah, I will. Uh, um, and John Brecky here. Um, epiguide, as you receive epiguide, it it is a dry. It is treated with. It is manufactured with a wetting agent. Mm -hmm. And the wetting agent, you know, putting it um, a little bit crudely, simply makes water wetter. Mm -hmm. So whenever Epiguide, as you take it out of the package, comes in contact with a water-based fluid, it will immediately imbibe that fluid and cause that fluid to enter all of its interstices or its void spaces. And that's what you see happening on the left-hand side. On the right. right hand side, you see that process now fully developed and ready for closure. Uh, it brings up a point of a dry wound. Now I'm probably old enough to be your, all of your grandfathers. <laughs> so I can remember my elderly professor saying, well, you want a dry wound. That means you pump in as much vasoconstrictor as, uh, vasoconstrictor as you can. Don't do that. Let, let the wound accumulate 
some whole blood from the patients, or from, from the patient, and at least enough volume of it to saturate Epiguide as you see it. Do not try to pre-wet this with water or with saline. No matter how tempting that might be, just don't do that. Right. And also, if you're if you allow the site blood to hydrate, you're getting all of the uh, all of the growth factors. You're getting all oh, sure. of these uh, protein elements. You're getting a, a lot of of autologous healing um, materials that come from the site. And if you prehydrate it with saline or water, you're you're missing out on that um, potential um, within the epiguide membrane. So uh, I, I think it's um, I think it's great that you were kind of bringing that out in more detail. Okay. Um, next slide here are the indications. It's important for everyone to know what the indications are. On the, on the left-hand side, this is as we have it in our package insert. Um, it's very broad for use as an adjunct to periodontal restorative surgeries and the treatment of periodontal defects following established surgical procedures. That's a very broad statement. A contraindication is, however, that it's, it's contraindicated to be in the presence of active infection where purulence is produced. So uh, um, be aware of that contraindication. Most of our, our uses of, of this, really uh, when, you, when you go into the actual specific indications, extraction sockets, multiple tooth extractions with or without a, a buccal wall, any covering for bony voids, and, and as Dr. Brecky states, a place where there, any place where there's a hole in the bone. So <laughs> it has broad applications um, for, uh, for this, um, to, maybe, to uh, protect bony defect sites. Um, and, uh, and that's how a lot of our customers have been using it this way for 14 years. But it's important for you to know what the indications are and also where we see most of its, of its use. Um, any other comments, guys, on, the, uh, on these images or also on the, on the indications specifically? Well, maybe okay, on the periodontal a, side of things as well? Yeah, as a maxillofacial surgeon, um, when I was doing bone graft procedures, I would use Epiguide to, um, uh, to protect whatever bone voids might have been unavoidable between the host bone and the graft bone. Right. Wh wherever there is a void, if, if unwanted cells can migrate faster than bone can develop, bone's gonna lose. And uh, so this is a protective measure. Right. That's great. I think this, uh, these images show, you know, successful use of the materials with sutures and, and uh, elsewhere. So I, I think the, the indications here are pretty clear. Um, what I'd like to go into now is just some, some information on some frequently asked questions that we get. Um, and uh, like I said uh, at the beginning, if you have any questions of, that we can answer um, on the next slide or after these frequently asked questions, we will, uh, we will kind of open it up and, and read your questions and, and try to answer them on here as well. So the first one is how is EpiGuide metabolized? Um, so the answer really is it's slowly metabolized within the site. It releases low molecular weight polymer fragments that are phagocytized by local macrophages, but, and also free lactic acid molecules that pass into adjacent cells, further metabolize into ATP, carbon dioxide, and water. Um, and those are the references that we, we have for its uh, me metabolization. There's no free lactic acid that accumulates at the implant site. So um, its metabolism and it, you know, how does this membrane and how does this PLA go away over time and remodel into the host bone, um, into the host soft tissue. Um, so it really has a, a very clear process. Um, and this is, uh, is done in, in situ there. Um, Anything else, guys, you want to talk about regarding its metabolization or um, those kind of, this is a, a pretty detailed description, but anything more specifically you want to go over? Well, uh, no, I mean, that's... That's, <laughs> that's it. Okay, great. <laughs> so the next one is, should EpiGuide be left exposed with the limited or no primary closure? No. So uh, <laughs> the short answer is no. Primary closure is always preferred. Um, however... Should the mucoperiosteal flap become compromised following closure, EpiGuide's architectural and structural properties will reduce the extent of wound exposure. Um, but be sure also to use normal suturing techniques. Don't try to, uh, um, you know, to stress the membrane or stress the soft tissue, the adjacent soft tissues. Normal suturing techniques should be uh, provided. But really, the 
it should not be left exposed if there is uh, appropriate soft tissue that's available. But certainly if you're, uh, if you're in a situation where you, uh, you have some complications on soft tissue um, and primary closure, the EpiGuide will assist in that because of its architecture. Um, yeah, okay, I'll add a couple of things. Okay, great. In the distant mists of surgical technique, <laughs> it used to be preferred, well, a couple of things, uh, if, if the access needed to be larger in our field, um, we would be advised to put in a vertical component to the flap, a vertical incision. Mm -hmm. That's not good practice. And if, if better access is needed to insert the membrane or to have the membrane um, comport or conform to the um, to the uh, bone anatomy over which it is placed, make the incision horizontal envelope incision longer. It's okay. And then be careful with the retractor so that you don't place excessive stress on the mucoperiosteum, which could be could be exerted sufficient to compromise its own collateral circulation. Then enclosure, uh, interrupted sutures through the interdental papilla on, on a, that class two furcation that we saw. Right. There may be other ways of using interrupted or, or mattress sutures for uh, in, uh, when it's used as an implant cap sheet. And then of course you have to be creative doing a bone graft. Uh, you have to do whatever you have to do to get it closed, but get a primary closure. Okay. Uh, this is David. I'd like to comment at this point from what I'm hearing is that accompanying the closure of Epiguide, if there's a chance and even in uh, normal situations, a good medicated postoperative uh, hygiene oh, rinse yeah. is a very good idea. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. So we've... Uh, we have some information about the Paradex or any kind of chlorhexidine types of rinses afterwards. Okay. Certainly want to okay. keep it um, clean. That's our last uh, um, comment yeah, here, but okay. we, we, can, uh, we can address it here now. Really, uh, okay. as as uh, John here, again, yeah. don't let your patients use hydrogen peroxide. <laughs> That's yeah. not a good idea. <laughs> right, so the Paradex or some chlorhexidine, those types of things. Um, another question that pops up is, can you suture through EpiGuide? You know, the short answer is yes. Um, you know, you, you want to anchor it to the, to the adjacent soft tissues um, to stabilize it. But really, if you remember the, uh, the cartoons, you remember the SEM images, those types of things, um, they're, uh, as this living tissue uh, membrane kind of starts to remodel, it's gonna anchor to these adjacent tissues as well. So uh, suturing can certainly help. Um, but also it's designed to, uh, to, to kind of be that anchoring as it remodels fully. Um, any other comments, guys, on, on suturing or any kind of tips and tricks regarding that? I know you've spoken a little bit about it already. No. Okay. Uh, next question, should, should EpiGuide be pre-saturated prior to placement? We've talked extensively about this, but we wanted to reinforce this. Um, it must be saturated with whole blood from the surgical side of plant implantation. Also recommended to use minimal use of vasoconstrictors um, to, uh, to allow these autologous fluids to be absorbed by the EpiGuide at the time of surgical placement. And uh, please do not use sterile saline or sterile water to hydrate EpiGuide. So those are our frequently asked question pieces. So now if you have any, uh, any questions for uh, the presenters here, Feel free to type your questions in the comment section, um, and uh, and we will uh, we will be happy to answer these questions. So uh, feel free to uh, to ask these questions, and uh, we'll just pause for a second. Um, again, it's it's very interesting how many people we have on today, and where where they're located. It's kind of all over the place, which is great. Um, and we hope this information has been helpful for you guys. Um, I know it's very uh, all compressed into a, a short period of time, but any other questions, feel free to uh, enter the question in the chat box. Okay, well, it doesn't sound like we have any questions. Oh, here's one. Um, so it says, in light of your explanation of the healing process, 
and protection the epi guide provides to the surgical site, it seems that it would be better not to penetrate the membrane barrier during suturing. What do you guys think about that? Uh, um, I, um, I understand the question, and uh, you know, I think it's a good question, but it really, uh, the, passing a suture um, through the membrane, it'll, first of all, through the mucoperiosteum, then through the membrane, and then through whatever anchorage point is available on, on the other side, is, is not, um, does not significantly compromise the barrier. Uh, the sutures are very small, although I have now forgotten what what, what would a uh, a three o or two o mm -hmm. sure. suture be. But but it, that's a small penetration, and and the barrier the the uh, but but your question brings up a point that we really haven't stressed the mm, mechanical engineering. I, that's not quite the right term either. It's uh, the engineering of the structure of the epiguide membrane. Um, builds in some redundancy so that it can tolerate uh, penetration by a suture. I would uh, uh, comment that I think that combining a suture through the mucoperiosteum and the epiguide at the same time is preferred yeah. over a suture directly through epiguide alone. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Okay. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Because it could tear in that case. Well, yeah, it could. But, but if you can anchor it to its source of collateral circulation, mm -hmm. um, that's the thing to do. Okay. Good question. Hopefully that was uh, answered for you guys. Again, if you have any questions, um, feel free to type it in the chat box, and we're happy to answer that for you. Um, we'll just... Uh, See if there's a one or two others here. We have a response coming here. I'll, I'll come right. Uh, I'll come right back to that in a, in a second. But I wanted also to uh, to give just as some closing here um, before we close up, and then I'll, I'll go back. Um, the CE information will be provided um, to your registration email, um, the one that you use for registration within seven to 10 business days. So uh, be on the lookout for that. Um, also, if you have any additional questions about uh, the EpiGuide membrane, you can reach out to the distributor who invited you to our webinar. And we have several of those that are, that are on today. You can also reach out to us. Um, a, through uh, our email, which is regenerative medicine, no, no period, um, at curasan.com. Um, if it's outside of the United States or Canada, feel free to email our um, Germany corporate office and our sales and marketing office outside of Frankfurt, and that is info at curasan.de, C U R A S A N.de. If it's within the United States or Canada, um, use the, uh, the email above. Um, special thanks to our dis distribution partners who invited their customers today. We really appreciate that. Um, and also, don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. We put a lot of content up. We're really doubling and tripling down the uh, surgical videos that we have, our connectivity to our audience and to our customers. Um, we really like being involved. Our Instagram is certainly uh, um, higher up when it comes to followers, so continue to do that on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn, and below are our handles for, uh, for those three social media groups. Um, also, you can look at our website, curasan.com. It has all our information on our dental um, portfolio, as well as our orthopedics portfolio as well in the US and Canada. And uh, our telephone number is uh, listed down there as well. Um, so uh, I think that's it, guys. We, uh, we have come to the end of our slides and our questions. Um, but again, wish everyone a happy holidays. And we really appreciate Dr. Brecky and uh, Mr. Langley for participating today. I thought it was very informative. And uh, I think I learned a lot throughout this process and hopefully the attendees did as well. Um, so again, feel free to reach out to us and uh, we're happy to, uh, to be involved with you guys. And I really appreciate your attendance today. And uh, we wish you guys a good rest of the day. Thank you guys in Duluth. Appreciate it. Oh, there. Uh, stand by. There's another. Oh, another question? Okay. Yeah.
I've always worried that the fibroblast can seep in at the edges of the epiguide where it contacts the bone. From what you're saying, how long does it take for the epiguide to fasten to the adjacent bone to prevent fibroblast invasion? Yeah, okay. Um, is this thing still running, Shane? It is, yeah, go oh. ahead. Yes, excellent question. Um, first of all, the epiguide does not fasten to the underlying bone it is anchored to the overlying mucoperiosteum. Okay. Uh, the fibroblasts uh, will not, you know, in any kind of quantity, they, they won't <laughs> crawl around the edge and make a U-turn and, and a beeline for the bone void. They're going to be stopped there. Okay. That's a great question. Also, I think that uh, in most cases, the epiguide extends beyond the edge of the oh, bone void, oh, yeah. which uh, gives an additional space uh, or preventive space uh, for the epiguide to migrate through. Okay, that's good. I mean, I mean the fibroblast. Right. Also, if there's uh, additional questions after today, um, you're, feel free to reach out to us and we can put you guys in contact with Dr. Brecky and Mr. Langley um, as any follow-up questions come yeah. up that they could uh, communicate with you guys directly. We're happy to help facilitate that. Yeah, um, stand yeah. by, Shane. It looks Another, like okay. Dr. Herbach is typing now. Yep, I see that. Um, just, we got a conversation here. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, yes, but it seems that the membrane isn't always uh, perfectly, perfectly stable. stable where it is placed during suturing. Mm. Well, that's right, it's not perfectly stable. It, it could be moved a bit as the mucoperiosteum moves over the, the defect. Mm -hmm. But as long as it's um, uh, adherent or, or juxtaposed to the mucoperiosteum, the fibroblasts are prevented from entering the bone wound. Okay. Here we go again. It'd be great to have a thing. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> it could be. We Dave, what, what did we uh, do? It, yeah, five hundred was 500. our five hundred was our original design, and then yeah. I had uh, asked for and didn't receive permission to uh, generate a seven hundred and fifty for an implant cap uh, site, but uh, it, I didn't get my way. <laughs> Yeah, the uh, the current Epi Guide is the uh, is the main that's main one that's available for sale now. We we don't have any additional thicknesses, and there's none in development um, currently. Well, so. but but as as a point of fact, sure. it could be made to any dimension mm -hmm. right. uh, within reason. So I um, I agree with you. Right. When can we buy it? What well, you have to have <laughs> just worry about that. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, that's why I designed it for uh, 18 by 30, which is oversized for most wound sites. Yeah, yeah. Just for the overlap effect. So yeah. having it to be an overlap it, itself, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Interesting. The original design for this thing some 30 years ago came from practicing oral surgeons, periodontists, and implant dentists. Right. And we see a broad utilization now of not only um, periodontists, but oral surgeons, um, general dentists for socket preservation, for implant defects, and any kind of, we see it all over with all of our different customer bases now. Um, so it's interesting that it was originally developed for um, periodontists. I'd like to add at this time that it was originally designed to go over a completely bone, uh, a void, bone void, and uh, is migrated, the use is migrated to some sort of uh, filler material in each and every one. And uh, whether it's filled or whether it isn't filled doesn't seem to affect the uh, performance of Epiguide. Right. Okay. That's all the questions we have on here. So uh, we'll go ahead and wrap this up again. Appreciate everyone's time. Thank you guys in Duluth. Um, yeah. Certainly uh, wish you guys a happy holidays as well. And uh, again, just feel free to reach out to us. We're happy to help or also reach out to your distribution partners um, as well. They're happy to, uh, to help facilitate as well. 
Have a great holiday, everyone, and thanks for attending.